Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. As always, I hope you enjoy this legal education content, and today will be the day I earn that subscription. For today's story, we are doing a recounting of just events of yesterday. I am in LA, as many of you know, for VidCon and also for Alita's wedding, Legal Bites wedding. She was married, of course, legally, I believe six years ago. Um, she's a military spouse, and for a variety of practical reasons, I assume, um, was unable to have a formal ceremony until yesterday, which was extremely lovely. Um, I, I don't believe I've ever been to a Catholic wedding before. Um, it was not as long as I've heard Catholic weddings can be, and it was, it was notable because the person performing the wedding was the Archbishop of Lithuania, who apparently is... Alita's godfather, so that's a thing. Uh, so I was like, well, if you're going to go to a Catholic wedding, why not have one that's performed by an archbishop? Okay, that's thing. That's something we're doing today. And then, of course, you know, just because we have to show our we have to show our street cred, we actually got a uh, a formalized I don't know what you would call it prayer endorsement certificate, it was in writing, uh, attesting to the marriage from the Pope. So, very Catholic, I suppose, is the end conclusion of that story. So, very, very interesting, for sure. Uh, it, was a, it was a beautiful wedding. Alita looked fantastic. I uh, had a great time and met a lot of great people. Including, most perhaps notably for me personally, um, the members of LawTube, as it were, or whatever we are. You know, uh, boss attorney Bree was there. I didn't know she was coming, so that was very pleasant. That was a nice surprise to see her. And then, of course, we had Andrew from Legal Mindset, Runkle from the Bailey. We had Law Talk Mike, Law Talk with Mike. We had Law and Lumber, Alita, of course, myself, Nate the Lawyer. Joe was there for a little bit of it, um, but because of the Sabbath, he was unable to attend for uh, most of the reception, which of course was Friday night, which was unfortunate because I wish we could have spent more time uh, together and uh, in, each, in each other's company even enjoying it. But it's not, not to fret, my friends. There's a uh, breakfast thing this morning at some point, I think it's 11 or something like that, where we will get together and have some more fun and frivolities. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to do this stream though was to talk about a nice conversation I had with Johnny Depp's BFF, Josh, who appeared on a stream, appeared on a charity stream with us, uh, with Legal Bites. And I got to meet him in person. Also, incidentally, I uh, got to meet Photo Chad from the Rittenhouse case in person, which was pretty badass. Um, anyways, so and, and also the, there's the photo. The, so uh, I posted a photo on Twitter of like four of us together. I think it was me, Lawn Lumber, Law Talk with Mike, and Ian Runkle, and that photo was taken by photo chat. So I got photo chat credit, baby. You know, that photo was taken by photo chat. So just saying, we're rolling deep over here in LA. All right, but I want to talk about this conversation I had with Josh, uh, Johnny Depp's BFF, because it was a very interesting conversation. And it was, it was interesting for a number of levels because it was interesting in trying to relay my perspective as a lawyer versus his perspective as someone who's been intimately familiar with the case and obviously intimately familiar with Johnny Depp himself and so has uh, a lot of personal interest in this uh, case for that reason. And I think, I think at first he was frustrated by me because I am kind of who I am in, online, right? I just try to give straight answers no matter who I'm talking to. And I, I think... I mean, I could be wrong, but I think he was frustrated with me initially. But I think by the end, he understood me. And he was actually very complimentary towards me at the end. And said that he thought that 
I'm going to get this wrong as I'm going to paraphrase it, but said something along the lines of that he thought I was really loyal to the law as like it should be as an ideal and trying to uphold that. And I was very pleased by that because that's something I, I try very hard to do. And it was interesting because we had a conversation about the trial strategy and the trial team and what they did or did not do versus my outside perspective as a lawyer and coming to the defense of Johnny Depp's legal team to whom um, to whom he had some criticisms and and my perspective as an outsider with limited information because my information is almost entirely from the trial as as is my typical thing it's like I only I try to stay within the confines of the case so he was frustrated at least in part because he felt that the team from Broad Runneck, Ben Chu and Camilo Vasquez had left in, had left a lot of things off the table had left a lot of things on the table not brought a lot of things in the trial he thought that there was a lot of good evidence that was not brought into trial in particular he thought there were a lot of good eyewitnesses who were available and while he acknowledged the, the value of expert testimony he at least seemed to be, my, my general impression of the thing, seemed to be saying that for his money, he thought that the eyewitnesses were so powerful that it would be more beneficial to have them. He was also particularly critical of one witness in particular, who I, his name escapes me, who, who didn't testify, which is also one of the reasons, uh, because he didn't testify, who he thought would be particularly good. And he was also critical because there's some sort of notebook or some other sort of contemporaneous evidence or something that Johnny Depp has that, at least according to Josh, would completely destroy uh, Amber Heard's counterclaims. But of course, it wasn't presented at trial, so it doesn't exist. But that was part of the problem. It's like, why doesn't it, why isn't it at trial? And what I told him, what I tried to tell him, and as, as we had this evolving conversation, was, well, first of all, uh, first of all, as a general proposition, I assume well of my profession. There, uh, there are definitely assholes in my profession, as there are in every profession. Uh, but generally speaking, I, I assume relatively well of my profession. Um, I assume, and also, I only know what I can prove. Which I think is a good, it's a good, it's a good trait of an attorney, generally speaking. It's like, I only know what I can prove. So, I go into this with, whatever bias I might have, I go into it with the bias that Brown Rudnick, Ben Chu, and Camille Vasquez made decisions in good faith. Those decisions may or may not have been correct. They may or may not have been optimal. They may or may not have been ideal. In retrospect, they may not have been the wisest decisions. But... I think in my assumption is that they made decisions in good faith. And so to the extent they didn't bring information in or didn't bring witnesses in or didn't bring this evidence that would completely destroy Amber Heard's case in, I assume it is for a variety of very legitimate reasons. I assume it's because of evidentiary problems. I assume it's because we can't get, the, can't get it in because it's going to be hearsay or it's going to be, you know, whatever. We're going to have an evidentiary problem with it. Or if it's not an evidentiary problem, then it's a tactical consideration of a lawyer. One of the things a lawyer has to do is decide what to bring in and what not. And you can't really bring everything in because you'll con the, because the, the, the story will get muddled for the jury. You have to make it very, you have to make the whole thing clear for the jury. Ideally, like what you want, the ideal for a lawyer, for a trial lawyer, the ideal is you want an opening to be able to tell a story and you want it to just be the story arc, right? Just the bare bone foundations of the story. So you don't need to throw in detail. That's not what opening is for. But you give them a story that you're going to develop throughout in a narrative arc, right? And then your witnesses are 
I, again, in an ideal way, this isn't always possible for a lot of practical reasons, but in an ideal way, you want the witnesses to hit in sequence of the arc, right? The witnesses themselves are the arc, their stories are the arc, right? And then in closing, you then want to give the whole story again, now with the details that the jury has heard, and that's the ideal, right? So, when you're thinking about that, you have to decide what story. What is story and what is not, right? What is story and what is background? Or what is story and what is noise? You have to decide what to bring in and what not. And there is a great idea that is worthy of mention, which is to emphasize everything is to emphasize nothing. You know, it's like highlighting everything on the page is to highlight nothing on the page. So, one of the things a good attorney has to do is exclude. And they have to exclude even sometimes good things because it's just too many things. It'd be like adding one too many ingredients to a recipe. Like it might be a good recipe, it might be a good ingredient, and like all the ingredients are good, but it's just one too many things. Like, and you could have excluded some other ingredient. But it's just one too many things. That kind of idea, right? You have to be able to decide what's story and what's not. What's story What's and versus what's noise or what's background. What's just, what needs to be emphasized and what doesn't. So, my first presumption going into this is that's what Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez were doing. And they had a very difficult case. They had an extremely difficult case. In fact, if not for Amber Heard, making these completely outrageous claims on the stand, they had an unwinnable case. So they had to go in with an idea of that problem. And I think, and so to attack Amber Heard's case distracts from building your own case. And Amber Heard's case is just weak. Even on, even after the fact, it remains weak. Because it's legally weak. Amber Heard's case is legally weak, even after the fact. You know, it can be attacked because Walderman isn't an agent. The scope of the agency isn't defined. Um, he is an independent contractor, not an employee. Uh, the statements are not sufficiently deviated from reality as to comprise... Uh, defamatory scope and so forth and so on right so even after the fact even after the even afterwards like it's legally weak so it's not worth it's so when you're thinking about like why did they make the decisions they made it's like well maybe they made the decisions they made and I don't know this I'm just speculating but maybe they made the decisions they made because like when we all kind of got to the end we all kind of thought the counterclaims were dead and I kind of still think they are as a matter of appeal if Johnny Depp wants to go that way. But it's like, do you really want to spend time bringing in this great witness or this great bombshell evidence when it detract, distracts or could distract from your principal case that you're trying to build for Johnny Depp, which is an impossible to win case? Right? So it's like, do you spend that time attacking their weakest shit case rather than building up your own impossible to win case and so I thought maybe that was the reason they made the decisions they did in terms of what to present and what not to present and it just I think goes to show a lot about these these trial tactics and trial strategies it also goes a lot to show how different attorneys would make different assessments in terms of what, so there's not like one, there's not like one way to go. It's like tell, it's like asking a whole bunch of different musicians to play the same song. They're going to make different choices in how they in how they perform it, and these choices might be very strong loyalty to the original material, as it were, or with slight deviations, or gross deviations, or massive deviations, and some of those decisions may not work from the artist. They might have made sense to the artist going in, but they might not work. 
It might be the wrong room, wrong venue, wrong whatever, right? So just because it didn't work out didn't mean that the artist didn't make that decision in good faith. Or maybe the artist is just isn't good enough, as it were, in this analogy, right? So I think Josh was in part frustrated because he said, well, you know, they only brought in 48% of the case. And I made, a quip, I made a quip to him by saying, well, you know, if they had brought in the other 52% of the case, but not the 48% that they did bring in, you know, you'd be making the exact same argument. Because you'd be upset that they didn't bring that half in, right? So if they excluded half, if they had brought the other half in, but not this half, you'd be upset that they didn't bring in this half, right? Because, I mean, they only, ha they only had 61 hours. And it's true enough that they were left with five hours at the end, but... I don't really think that that's indicative of anything more than good trial management. Because you have to leave, at least in my view, you have to leave a pretty sizable buffer because you don't necessarily know what's going to happen. Right? Camille Vasquez's team, apologize, Elaine's, Elena's team, uh, Ron Bourne's team, had no time left at all. They ran out of time. And you saw how devastating it was. They ran out of time. They, uh, Camille Vasquez and Ben Chu left five hours on the table. But they were, I think, very wisely reserving time that maybe five hours was too much in the end. But then again, it's in the end. Did they know that going in? But I think they were very wisely reserving time because if they just burn all their time, then they have no time. They have no time to think. Like, so they had five hours at the end of excess that I suppose is wasted in some sense. But... When you're thinking about it from square one, when you're thinking about it from, you know, I have 61 hours, when you're thinking about it from that posture, and what do I bring in, what don't I bring in, and how much time do I need in reserve for whatever, for possible contingencies, when you think about it from that angle, it makes sense that they have five hours in reserve. I, and, uh, like, is that, like, an absurd amount of time to have in reserve? Not really. Because it's really easy to, like, think about this case, go back to the beginning of the case, it's really easy to see, like, in your mind, different ways the case could have developed where you need that time, and you were only left with three hours or two hours left, instead of, like, five. So, you know, I, I don't think even the fact that, so he was a little bit frustrated that they had five hours left, and I was like, well, you know, so at least to me, it's like, I don't know what I, I only know what I can prove. And I don't know that they're acting improperly. And like from first principles, from first principles, everything you're describing to me makes sense. Right? From first principles, everything you're describing to me sounds like it's a, something that could make sense. Right? They didn't bring in the great witness. They didn't bring in the great evidence. Okay, they didn't want to, they didn't want to go down that road. It was, it was too distracting. It was just one more thing they didn't need. Uh, they thought the case on Amber Heard's case was weak. They already thought they had it covered. They wanted to develop somewhere else. They needed more time and rebuttal, right? A whole bunch of reasons that it makes sense. And I was expressing all this to Josh, and I think initially, as I said, he was a little frustrated with me because, you know, I wasn't, you know, just shitting all over them and, you know, just, you know, saying that they're bad lawyers, which I have no reason to believe uh, for that reason. It was also interesting because we got to talk a little bit about the role of the attorney, generally speaking, in terms of an ethics posture. Because he was surprised when I described to him, like from a pure ethics posture, just how, how much power an attorney has. So, hiring an attorney is like hiring any other professional in a lot of ways. Right? You hire the professional to do their job. You tell them the job they want to do, the job, they, the job to do, but they're the ones that choose the methodology, right? You hire a plumber to unclog your toilet. The mission is to unclog the toilet. Do you then go in to the plumber and say, well, use this tool, use this tool, use this thing, use this? No, you, you don't do that because, like, it doesn't make any sense, right? It doesn't make any sense. You hire a doctor to perform the surgery. And it's like, I need my gallbladder removed. Whatever, right? The mission is to remove the gallbladder. Do you then go in and say, okay, I need you to use this kind of scalpel, not this kind of scalpel. I need you to use this, this thing, not this thing. I need you to do this way, this way. I need you to make this cut, this way. No, you don't, you don't do that, right? 
the client sets this very broad goal, the professional, whether it's the plumber or the doctor or whatever, is the one that sets everything else. They're the one in control of everything else. And it's really no different in that vein for an attorney. So the attorney has massive amounts of control from a pure ethics posture. And like, what's ethically possible, right? Attorneys have different styles. I'm just telling you what's possible. So like I said to him, okay, Johnny Depp comes, Johnny Depp comes to me and says, I want to sue for defamation. Great. And I, as I explained to Josh, from a pure ethics posture of what's possible, basically that's the last decision Johnny Depp gets to make in that case. That's the last decision he gets to make. He already made all his decisions. He walked into my office and he said, I want to sue for defamation. And those are the end of his decisions that he gets to make from a pure ethics posture. Everything else is mine or can be mine in a pure ethics posture. Because like I'm the professional, you hired me. So I explained to him, like from a pure ethics posture, You're the client, you're the client. And you say, I want you to call this witness to the stand. And I'm like, no, I, I want you to ask this question. Nah, I want you to bring into evidence this exhibit. Not, no, no, right, no, no. Not gonna do those things. Now, of course I could say yes, right? I could say yes, if I think those are the right decisions, but I can say no. You know, I'm not gonna bring, but this is, this is my, this is a key, this is a key witness for me. You know, he's a key witness. I'm like, well, that's nice, but he doesn't fit in with my strategy. You, and you, you see this a lot as an attorney when you're thinking about multiple different strategies, uh, multiple different ways to go. So I'll give you an example, like from a criminal case. Um, because you see this, we, we covered this recently in a death penalty case or a death penalty appeal, right? Um, there was a guy, it was a habeas petition we re recently covered. The attorney went with, uh, this guy has, uh, mental, just purely like mental issues. He has like personality issues. He has, uh, um, mental, mental disease issues, right? The, the, the guy who lost his death penalty case just recently was bitching because as a child apparently he had had some sort of serious fall and had hurt himself hurt his brain and so he wanted to argue that you know there was some sort of organic problem with this physical brain the physical brain that there was some organic problem with it and um, Reading the Court of Appeals decision, uh, the attorney did all of his due diligence. He did all the things he was supposed to do in terms of looking at these lines of inquiry. So he can't just like say no for the hell of it. He can't just arbitrarily say no. He has to look at all the possible lines of inquiry. But once he does that, the decision is his. And so he says, what the attorney ultimately says is, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm only going to bring in this, I'm only going to do this you know, uh, psychological stuff, not any sort of physical stuff. And now, that's the attorney's decision to make. It also isn't incidentally to say that if the attorney had brought that in, that it would have helped, which is a whole other set of problems. And you might be saying to yourself, well, not, why not bring it all in? Why not bring it all in? Well, you might be able to, but there are problems, right? Because juries don't, juries don't really like it when you're trying to like all, offer ultimate multiple different things, you know? It's like, I didn't do it, but if I did, I was justified, you know? It doesn't really quite work, right? Even if there's a legal, even if it kind of makes sense legally, it doesn't quite work, you know? Oh, it was, it was that I was, uh, it was, it was that I was psychologically mentally deficient. But if you don't like that answer, it's because I had a physical organic disability because of an accident. But if you don't like that answer, it's because I didn't do it at all, right? You can see where this becomes a bit of a problem. Or it can become a bit of a problem. And where an attorney might have to make a decision. It's like, no, I'm gonna go this way, not that way. I'm gonna bring this evidence in, not that evidence in, right? I'm gonna call this witness to develop this
theory of the case and not call these witnesses because it goes to a different theory of the case that I don't want to bring in because I don't think it'll win. I think it's weak. It's just going to confuse the jury. The jury is going to think I'm speaking on both sides of my mouth or I don't have time, or whatever, a hundred different other tactical, strategic reasons, the attorney might make that decision. Right? Now, the client, of course, can fire the attorney. Right? That's the client's role. Because I, I was like, what are the decisions the client cuts to make? I told you right, I told you right from the beginning. Johnny Depp walks into my office, and he says, I want to sue for defamation. Those are all the decisions he gets to make. So what are his decisions? to say I want to change what I'm suing for or to walk out of my office. Those are his decisions, right? Those are the decisions he gets to make. And so he can fire me if he doesn't like the answer. This is understandable, of course, and to some degree appropriate. You have to have chemistry with your attorney, but you don't want to necessarily go too far the other way on this. And you want to... You want to retain enough independence to make enough independent decisions. And I think the example to illustrate that point is Elena. Elena Bredoff's role as an attorney in that case. It seems, from my outside standpoint, from what I can tell, that it appears that Elena surrendered too much of her professional judgment to the client. Roddenborn had a winning idea. He could have won that case, in my view. The reason, well, a, a major reason that he didn't is because he wasn't first chair, because Elena was first chair. Elaine? Elaine. Because Elaine was first chair. Apologize, thanks for correcting me. Because Elaine was first chair, he didn't have the ability to drive the case. And Elaine surrendered too much to the client. So this is a bit of a danger and a bit of a cautionary tale for everyone as they're hiring their own attorneys. You as the client get the right to control the to hire the attorney. You may be well advised to hire an attorney who might have to say no to you sometime. And then it just becomes a question of is this the right attorney for you? Are they making the right decisions? Are they going to win your case? And so forth and so on. But you know should you know should the attorney be of the should the attorney be of the kind of like well, yeah, uh, all the decisions you get to make is walk into my office and tell me, like, I want to sue for defamation. Should, he, should they be that strict? Probably not. But if you surrender too much, you wind up with Elaine's territory, where basically the client is the one driving the entire case. To the point, it's, it compromises your professional role. And again, this is not a unique problem or a unique reality to attorneys. This at least seems to be the same sort of analysis that would apply, again, to a plumber or to a doctor, right? It's like they have to, ha you have to have enough confidence in them as a professional to believe that they're able to do the job and they make decisions and sometimes those decisions work and sometimes they don't. And it doesn't mean that the, that the professional was corrupt. It doesn't necessarily even mean they were incompetent. It just means that it didn't work out. And because there is some artistry to the thing, which I also pointed out, I also pointed out it's a little bit like a producer of a show hiring a musician for the show. Right? You imbue, as a producer, you imbue the mus musician you hire to make choices as a musician. And most musicians, and I'm sure Josh would agree with this. Most musicians, most most musicians, <coughs> apologies. Most most musicians get kind of a little bit pissed when you start to impose on them, right? 
Some will, some are more amenable than others. Some are really strict and like, no, it's just like you hire me or you don't, right? Some are really strict, but most musicians, uh, you know, get a little bit pissed the more and more you impose on them. And if you are the kind of musician that never says no, and you just give the client anything they want, you kind of see what kind of experience that gives you. So I kind of tried to make that analogy to Josh to show why, you know, maybe, maybe it isn't corruption, maybe it's not incompetence, maybe it's not this, maybe it's just that there's a lot of different things they could do, like Johnny Depp's team, there's a lot of different things they could do, a lot of different witnesses they could call, a lot of different questions they could ask. They've got 61 hours, they got to figure out what their overall story arc is going to be. They got to figure out how they're going to tell the overall story arc in a way that makes sense. Hopefully, in a smooth way, in a smooth narrative that just drives the jury to one inexorable conclusion. Right? That's what you want. And the degree to which they succeeded in that goal is open to analysis. It isn't to say that every decision they made is perfect or couldn't have been different or that they couldn't have made a different decision that might have been better in retrospect. But that being said, from my outside posture, again, because I only know what I can prove, um, from my outside posture, it seemed to me the team of Brown Runnick in the form of Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez we're doing things appropriately. It's like, I understand to some degree, Josh, that you're a little frustrated that this, what from your point of view, devastating evidence didn't come in that would just, you know, further blow Amber Heard apart. I understand you're a little frustrated that they didn't bring in more uh, person witnesses, like fact witnesses, just normal people, and brought in maybe too many experts. I'm understanding that you're a little frustrated by some of these choices. I am understanding that you're a little frustrated that they blew some of the depositions in your view. Um, you know, they didn't go perfectly. Uh, but from my outside standpoint, I remain of the viewpoint that, that Ben Chu and Camille Vasquez are great attorneys. We also talked about Adam Wallman, the architect of this whole thing, who created the framework to be able to win this case and his role. Now, I will, I will make a note here that the most brilliant architect in the world can be thwarted by an incompetent builder. So, as brilliant as Alvin Walt, Adam Waldman may or may not be, and from all I tell, he seems to be brilliant, that is in no way to suggest that Ben Chu and... Camille Vasquez, who actually were the ones who executed on that, were not competent in their own right and couldn't have fucked it up if they weren't good, right? The most, co the most competent architect in the world, someone can fuck it up. So, since they didn't fuck it up, I think that they deserve credit for their role in executing on the plan of the architect's plan. And also, because... Uh, who was it? Was it uh, Muhammad Ali or G George Foreman or something? someone of those who basically said, you know, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face? Or, uh, you know, the, 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 the preparations the preparations last until first contact with the enemy? Maybe that's Patton or someone like that? That kind of idea, right? So, no matter how brilliant Adam Woman is, he can't possibly be brilliant enough to deal with every contingency. It's unrealistic. You need someone who's actually going to be able to execute for, you know, as things change and develop, and, of course, leave rebuttal time for all the possibilities that uh, will eventually emerge. So, you know, all that. Now, that being said, of course, I still want to go back and talk about Admin Waldman, because Admin Waldman had an impossible case. I've, I've said it before, and I've said it bef again, and I'll say it now. If Johnny Depp walked into my office, as it were, with this case today, I'd laugh in his face. It's impossible to win. And it's, again, only, it's, it's almost, it's hard to see how he wins if Amber Heard 
doesn't make a complete ass out of herself. And how can Admin Wallman control that? I mean, unless he's just that good at being able to goad her, although it doesn't seem ultimately necessary because she's just that much of a narcissist. But you would never bank on that as an attorney. You would never bank on that because even like hardened criminals and stuff can be on their best behavior in court, right? They don't have to do it for very long. They just have to do it for a couple of hours or something while they're talking to the jury. So even total assholes can usually, with a little bit of training, a little bit of prep, do okay in court. Convicted murderers have been able to do less or have had problems. Uh, or been able to be better control is what I meant to say compared to Amber Heard. So even in retrospect, it's impossible because what attorney in their right mind is going to anticipate or bank on the idea that Amber Heard is going to get on the stand and not say, you know, he punched me once or not say he grabbed me by the arm once or not say he verbally berated me or not say any of the other things that would be winnable. One attorney in their right mind is going to be like, yes, we are going to win this case because Amber Heard is definitely going to get on the stand and she's going to say, uh, yeah, I was totally put down on a table and uh, wailed on repeatedly. And by the way, here's a photo of me the next day looking perfectly great. It's like, who, whose fantasy is this, right? So, like, it's not disrespect out of Admin Woman, but it's just like, it's, a, it's impossible, because you never, you could never bank on such an incredibly stupid thing of happening. And I guess, maybe he just had enough confidence in Amber Heard shitting on the bed from past experience <laughs> to think it was worthwhile. And I guess maybe he was right in the end, but damn. It's like, you know, you never see that one coming. So it's it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit, you know, problematic. And then you take this big pile of, you take this big pile of shit as Adam Wallman and try to develop something that resembles a, a working theory that you won't be laughed out of court with, which is still a bit of a miracle. They managed to make it pass a motion to dismiss, to be honest. I mean, in retrospect, yeah, but at the time, like, on that motion to dismiss, man, the fact that they got past that motion to dismiss and the case went to trial, <laughs> shit, dude. I mean, I'm not sure that was the right decision legally, to be honest. Um, but that they were able to go in with a straight face and had, a, had something to be able to make out a winnable argument. And it's like, well, even in retrospect, you, even in retrospect, you'd never see that one coming. It's like it's impossible. So I, I don't know what miracle they pulled from to be able to, to get it from. And I told Josh, I was like, you know, since he knows Wallman apparently, and they talk like five times a day, I told Josh, it's like, you know, I was like, I said to him, like, you know, talking to Johnny Depp would be nice and all, but could you get me an interview with Wallman? <laughs> because that would be, that would be more interesting for me. Because I, it's not that I, of course, wouldn't talk to Giant Depp. I'd be thrilled to. Um, but talking to someone like Wallman, who is this grand architect and has to put together a strategy when you are on such an incredibly bad posture, legally, it's like, you know, pretty impressive. So, you know. So it was a really interesting conversation because we got to talk about the role of an attorney. The role of an attorney is advocate. The role of the attorney is counselor. The role of the attorney is the professional. The role of the attorney as the guy who can say no. And just because they said no and excluded your witnesses and exclu just because your own attorney, mind you, your own attorney is telling you no and excluding what you think are your great witnesses and excluding what you think is your great evidence doesn't mean that they're corrupt incompetent or wrong it may or may not ultimately work out in the end but it doesn't flow even if it doesn't work out in the end that they were incompetent not sufficiently zealous or wrong right because professionals have to make choices and not to put too fine a point on it but the other side has their own attorney 
who's working equally hard on winning their side of the argument and making their own choices to win and someone's going to lose at the end of the day and it doesn't necessarily mean either of them either side was either side's attorneys at least were incompetent or wrong or ill-informed they made decisions that may or may not have panned out they may have made decisions the client disagreed with they may have made frustrating decisions but those decisions might be completely understandable because of narrative architecture reasons because I don't want to present multiple different theories of the case to the jury, because I don't want to develop, I don't really need to develop, at least in my view, my response to Adam to uh, Amber Heard's claim, because it sucks ass, and maybe they lost, which they did, but how do you know that going in? You have to make some choices. So they lost, but you know, that's the way it goes sometimes, which I know is frustrating when you're talking about $2 million, but still. You know, it's like what do you? It's like you know, you gotta make you gotta make choices. You gotta make choices. And of course, if things don't pan out, in the end, it's always because the attorney fucked it up. When you know, or at least that's the client's perception of it, because they didn't win. Especially if you have someone like Johnny Depp, incidentally, who, for the absolute record, I believe, was a victim of domestic violence, and I believe Amber Heard is a lying liar who lies. Right? So nothing I've said in this entire description, this entire video, nothing I've said should be made to understand that I disagree with the underlying factual reality of it all. But I'm a lawyer, and I only know what I can prove. And as I'm putting myself into their shoes... And I'm putting myself into their shoes at different time frames so that I remember, or I try to at least remember, like, what is true at that time? Like, what is the state of things at that time? Like, so I think about, like, what is the state of things when Giant Depp walks in the door? What is the state of things when Camille Vasquez gets the case? What's the, start, what's the, what's the state of things at the start of the trial? What is the state of things at this point? What's the state of things at this point? And try to remember those things. And try to walk, try to go backwards in time to, to factor those things in the equation. And then I talked to someone like Josh, and he's very frustrated because, again, certain things didn't happen he wants to, and I, and I just do what I normally do, which is just give an honest assessment of it. And I'm just like, oh, you know, it could be the case. It was interesting, too, because, like, for example, it was it was interesting because we talked about one specific thing in an example where he disagreed with me. Um, with Amber Heard going to the courthouse to get her TRO, to temporary restraining order. Amber Heard does not have to go to the courthouse to get that temporary restraining order in California. She can send her attorneys. So we had a bit of a dispute between me and Josh because I forget the exact context of how it came up, but basically Josh asked me, so do you bring, so I think it was because they didn't bring it up because Amber, because Johnny Depp's team didn't bring it up. They didn't bring up the fact that she didn't have to be there. I'm like, I'm not sure I would bring it up either. It's like, but why wouldn't you? She doesn't have to be there. She says she doesn't want publicity. She says she doesn't want to hurt him, but she's showing up there in person. I'm like, yeah, but she has a legal right to be there. He's like, yeah, but she doesn't have to be there. I'm like, yeah, but she has a legal right to be there. I'm not 100% sure I can even ask that question. Now, mind you, I'm hearing this for the first time as the words are coming out of his mouth. So I've been thinking about it for three-tenths of a second. But, like, you know, I'm not, it's like I'm not even 100% sure I can ask that question. And then he went off and asked, like, other attorneys, and some of them apparently disagreed with me, which, you know, isn't the first time. But... And was frustrated, I think, because like I wouldn't ask that question either. It's too, you know, it's too distracting. It's too distracting. It doesn't make this point. And also, like he admires Waldman, because Waldman's willing to do whatever it takes to win. And you know that can be a good trait. But then see, for example, Elaine Bredehoff, and see what that can look like in a more negative viewpoint. So doing whatever it takes to win. Sounds like a great thing, in principle, 
But then you wind up in a situation where you're lame, you're making absurd claims, you are giving too much to the client, you are deferring too much, you are abandoning your professional responsibility, and it's not going great. So it's like, you know, so maybe I'm a little bit more, I'm a little bit more restrained or a little bit more, I'm not willing to push, maybe I'm not willing to push the envelope as much as, uh, as they are in some domains. But, you know, I have my, I have maybe a slightly more conserved view, or as Josh, I think, ultimately put it, I'm paraphrasing again, that I'm a little bit more legally pure. I'm a little bit more devoted to the laws it should be and uh, a little bit more devoted to uh, the purity of it um, and less willing to push maybe the ethics issues to its outer boundaries. So it was a really interesting discussion and I thought it would be an interesting discussion for us to go over as well because we, w we could talk a little bit about the role of an attorney, why an attorney might make certain decisions. You probably want an attorney who will tell you no. That's probably a good thing. And then figuring out whether or not they're the right attorney for you or whether or not they're telling no in the right places. That, of course, becomes the challenge of the uh, exercise in the end. But just because Johnny Depp was found liable for $2 million doesn't mean inherently that choices were wrong. Also, as I mentioned, if Johnny Depp wants to appeal because she can't because she doesn't have the money for the bond, but if Johnny Depp wants to appeal, I think he has pretty good odds. Well, he has, he has good odds going in on appeal. Her, her appeal options are not great. I was talking with Nate the lawyer and we were trying to develop an appeal for Amber Heard that wasn't completely absurd. And I think we made it work. So I think we finally developed a... I think we devi finally developed an appeal <coughs> theory for Amber Heard that wasn't absurd. It doesn't mean that it's winnable. But it's like, well, at least we could write this with a straight face if we had to. So that was nice. It's like, because, you know, it's like you, it's nice when you're able to think and try to think of something that might work. Um, but I think Johnny Depp, if he chooses to appeal, actually has some pretty decent choices and options. So, why would Johnny Depp appeal? I can think of two million reasons why, to be honest. Uh, just, you know, just off the top of my head. Um, so, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so that's really all I wanted to talk about for now. Um, I'm going to try to go to VidCon today. There's a lot of wedding stuff happening today. The wedding, of course, yester was yesterday, but there's reception stuff and a lot of stuff, and it's going to be kind of an all-day thing, but I might go for an hour or two this morning, and uh, we'll try to get some more stuff in terms of learning some more things about uh, all the rest of it. Uh, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. I'll end with this story, because it's an interesting story, and you got uh, you got to bug Nate the lawyer until he tells the story for himself on his own channel. Uh, I threatened, I threatened to like strap him down and make him tell the story. So you guys have got to, you guys got to tell the story. Okay. But I'll try to tell you, I'll try to tell you what I think the story was and you guys could, uh, go for there. All right. So at VidCon, there are a bunch of different vendors for things, including editing software I've never heard of before. Um, but whatever. So one of the vendors is TubeBuddy. So TubeBuddy and VidIQ, if those names sound familiar, they're extensions that you can get that will help you develop your channel. I use VidIQ, incidentally. It helps uh, with uh, creation of thumbnails a little bit. It helps with creation of uh, titles. You can do A-B testing. You can do like mass editing and stuff, right? So they're, they're tools that can help you in that respect. So he's, he goes to TubeBuddy. And uh, I wasn't there for the conversation, so this is all what he's explained to me after the fact. And now I'm going to uh, exaggerate the story. So it's hearsay upon hearsay and exaggerated, but here's what I understand happened. So Nate goes up there and they say, hey, how are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm great. 
It's like, oh, we would love to do a channel on it. Figure out how your channel's doing. Let's figure out how we can help you more. As to as two buddy, how we can, you know, help make your channel grow. Because we're two buddy, and we want to help your channel. So, uh, so he's like, great. So he's like, oh, what's your channel name? Nate the lawyer. And the the way I understand the story is, they they look at his channel and they're like, um, yeah, we can't help you. Uh, do you want to work for us? Do you would you like to give talks? Can you help us? Can you help us? Because we don't we don't know how you're doing this. How are you doing this? How are you getting these like, you know, 10 million views and 15 million views or whatever uh, on this stuff? How are you how are you doing these 200? You have these 250,000 subs that you have. You know, most of the people that are coming up and talk to us have got like 4,000 subs or 5,000 subs. It's like you got 250,000 subs. You got, how are you doing this? So you can just, you, you should teach us. We got nothing to tell you. So that's what I understand the story to be told. So, story to be. So, anyways, I'm going to sign off for now. I'm going to sign off for now because I just wanted to really relate the story. Uh, and just say it was really nice meeting all the people in person. Alita looked beautiful. Uh, I posted photos of it on Twitter. I, I've, I've also seen conspiracy theories are now circulating regarding the wedding, which I'm going to in absolutely no way dissuade. In fact, I told Alita that not only would I not dissuade them, uh, I, might be, I might be an inside, an anonymous inside source who can confirm these more salacious rumors. So if you... Uh, if you... <laughs> If you are working for the Washington Post or the, uh, or, uh, whatever, uh, and you need, <laughs> let's talk. Uh, <laughs> let's talk. <coughs> uh, <coughs> anyways, good times. All right, I'm going to sign up for now. Um, thanks, by the way, to the mods. I've been seeing you in chat fighting the bots. You're doing great you're doing great work. Uh, you can't really change the thing to members only or subscribers only on mobile, so we just have to bear through. But I'm going to sign off for now. All right, so if you've enjoyed this this thing, please remember to like, comment, subscribe. Yeah, TMZ, that's right. Uh, please remember to like, comment, subscribe, do the YouTube -y things, hit the join button. And until later, my friends, I hope all's well. Cheers, my friends, and goodbye.